Hello, good evening, happy Tuesday, and welcome to Fools Rush In. Uh, it's strange being live on a Tuesday night as well, but we have a very special guest joining us tonight, so it only seemed right to give him uh, his own special segment. But before we say hello to Gerald and tonight's panellists, let's, uh, let's roll with Fools Rush In titles. Take my hand. Take my whole life too But I can't help Fall in love with you And before I say hello to tonight's panel, I just want to send a very special hello to Rachel, who messaged us today. Uh, we were talking on last night's episodes about how we are listened to um, in a variety of countries, which shocked us when we got the stats. And, uh, and Rachel messaged today with her Swindon Town logo in her Twitter handle and said uh, she enjoys the show and she listens from America. So thank you very much for taking the time to listen to us regularly, Rachel. And we hope to continue entertaining you all the way across the pond uh let's uh let's start with tonight's panel and first of all uh hello and good evening to ben how are you pal hello fifey yeah pretty good buddy i'm pretty good all psyched up for this evening joe i one of my favorite players back in the day so it's gonna be good it's gonna be great and uh, we're spending a lot of time together at the moment, which is obviously a great value for the regular viewers and listeners because they love how we always see eye to eye on everything. Hey, like, we're family. We're like one big family, aren't we? One big happy family. Uh, you're not the only regular fool joining us. Uh, there's a special guest, which means Kieran's turned up. How are you, pal? <laughs> yeah, not too bad, thank you. Um, if we're one big family, Ben's like the creepy uncle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, big <laughs> the, the, the uncle, the uncle Fester of Fools Rush In. <laughs> yeah, it likes going to a chip shop on a night out. <laughs> um, obviously a little bit younger than us, Kieran, and I'm sure we'll come on to this, but you were saying to to us when, when we were setting up that Gerald would actually score the first goal you ever saw for in a Swindon game. Yeah, because the first Swindon game was that that Warsaw one in 2007 when we got promoted. You know, one game, one promotion wasn't too bad, and, and one goal from a centre centre back. So yeah, but it was yeah, it was the first goal I ever saw. Because you don't forget, you don't forget the first goal you scored. Certainly when it's the day you got promoted as well. Well, wow, absolutely. Uh, well, let's say hello and good evening to the main man himself. Good evening, Gerald. Welcome to Fools Rush In. Hey, how are you? You all right? Very, very well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, not bad, not bad. Um, again, thank you very much for, for taking time out of your evening to, to chat to us for a little while. We really do appreciate it. Um, no problem. And I'm very much looking forward to uh, to what we may uncover this evening, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> if I can, and, and it's similar to what I've done on, on a few of these, I'd like to go right back to the very beginning, if I may, because uh, your, your family's got football running through its blood, basically. Did, did you kind of know from an early age you wanted to go into football or, or was that not necessarily something you wanted, but it, it kind of happened? No, I, I always wanted to play um, probably from about the age of, I would say nine. Um, so, you know, I was always playing in the park. My dad always used to take us to the park anyway. And he used to have a little goal that we used to um, set up in a, a place called Glasden Park in Northwest London. And we used to just strike balls into the goal. He used to, Anything that we could do football wise, we would we would do. But it was like deliveries, strikes, whatever. Just any little bit of fun, and it was just me, and my dad, and my other my brother Philip. Yeah. Uh, and obviously he benefited because he was younger than than like he was four years younger than me, so he was getting all of what I was getting four years earlier. Yeah. Um. So it was it was fun because we would just love just kicking a ball about. But obviously it had a benefit later on. Um, and then I say about 13 or 14 years old, I started writing letters to, to teams in the, from the yellow pages. Nice. <laughs> so, so I got the yellow pages started. I wrote to all the clubs that were in there asking for trials. Hmm. Um, didn't get, didn't get any. Um, but I played semi pro ish for Hendon. Hmm. Yep. Um, when I was about 16, I got kind of upgraded to like the reserves and was training with the first team. Um, and obviously for, I was quite, I was still quite small at that age. Um, so I hadn't kind of shot up in height, 
So I was playing centre back, but I could jump really high, and and you know people noticed that I read the game well, um, despite you know being a bit smaller. Um, so yeah, from that point, people started taking a little bit of notice. I managed to get a, a trial with Tottenham. I played. I was at Tottenham for a year as a schoolboy. Uh, I wasn't signed on or anything. I just played for him, <laughs> which, was, <laughs> which was a weird one. Like, I used to turn up. I used to go to Chigwell you know, play games. I, I think I played one of my first games a year above and um, uh, Peter Crouch was the person I was playing with. And I remember me and my dad looking at him thinking, oh, he's definitely a goalie. Spoiler alert, he wasn't. Yeah, no. he was decent <laughs> up front. Um, so, yeah, I didn't get my YT there. There was a big, to be fair, there was a big... Like a lot of disappointment and and just a lack of communication in that one because I thought I was going to get YT with them, um, and then they didn't even tell me, and I didn't know what oh. to do because I didn't know whether I was going to go to college or wh whatever it was I was going to be doing at that time. Hmm. Uh, I had to quickly sign up for a GMVQ because they didn't tell me. And at the time, my brother Philip, he was still in the in the schoolboys. He was like a what was I? I was fifteen, so he'd have been like eleven. And he was like, he was really revered at Tottenham at that time. Yeah. Um, as a, as a, you know, a prospect. So my dad went back the next season. I was like, oh, what about my, my other son? You know, you haven't told him whether he's got a YT yet. And they went, who? <laughs> wow. The, wow. They didn't even, didn't, didn't even tell me or anything. The last thing I had from them was, I remember being sized up. So there was a kid, kiddie that I used to play with. We were both centre backs. Um, and they brought us both in. I think it was John Monker. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And he he brought us both into the office, and he kind of stood us back to back, and was like measuring our heights to see who was the tallest. Then they started asking us about um, our family like heights. So he's like, "How tall is your dad?" So my dad's five foot ten. His dad was like six foot something. How tall is your uncle? My six foot something. His was six foot something. You know. And then I was thinking, what is going on here? Like, so they were basically saying genetically, he's going to develop into being a taller centre back. It makes a lot more sense. Yeah. So after that, that's I didn't that's hear bizarre, a bizarre, isn't it? That is yeah. madness. That's absolute madness. How that could yeah. have done that. Especially so, John Walker as well. At Swindon, he was always seems quite cultured. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just don't know. Like this was like so early on in these guys' like careers because they they they're still in football now. Do you know what I mean? And, yeah. I think you get better with experience and sometimes we're the, we're the experiment, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, when, when he did that, I was like, okay, I kind of get where they're going from coming from. Um, but surely I've played well enough. You're playing me a year. Uh, they play me a year up for a lot of the year. Yeah. So you think, okay, but it just didn't work out, you know? So I ended up going back to Hendon and just playing for Hendon. And then I got a trial at Watford. Mm. Um, which was which was a two week trial, right? And they told me I wasn't good enough after three days, right? So it, it was it was it was crazy. So I was <laughs> I turned up. They're doing all this kind of like, like well, I say the Namby Pamby stuff, kicking it up, drilling balls, and then keeping it up and all this kind of stuff. Mm. All I had done at, from at that age was play games. I had all I knew how to do was play games. We, you know, semi-pro. You train twice a week. You're not yeah. technically developing yourself. Mm -hmm. So all I knew was be physical, look after yourself because I was playing with men at times, um, and then read the game. Um, and what they did in the first two days, I was not good at, and I was nervous at the same time. Of course. So um, I was there with my coach's son from Hendon, and they told my coach, and my coach forgot to tell me. And so I've gone back like on the third day and they're looking at me like, what the hell is this guy doing here? We told him not to come back. Right. So, but he didn't say anything to me. Right. <laughs> so lo and behold, on the day that I was there, on the day I wasn't supposed to be there, they did defensive stuff and they put me up against their first year pros. And I dominated in, in that situation. And at that time, then I got an arm around me. Oh, do you want to come on? Um, do you want to come uh, on tour in, uh, I think it was Norway, I believe it was. And then they took me to Norway, went on tour. I did really well there and they signed me. So, so it's amazing how these things come about yeah. in, in such bizarre 
or, or strange circumstances like that, isn't it? To, to be told not good enough and then it just be a, a matter of timing and and, and things like that. Um, well, I can elaborate on that story a little bit more. Please. Um, so, <laughs> so I signed after coming back from Norway mm. I, and I played my first game of the season um, in August. So I, I think I signed about I don't know, July times, and I had my first game in August. And we played Fulham. Now, what you can do in these games is you can play a couple of first or uh, first year pros. Yeah. Um, so they can drop down into our year group. So they, they played a couple of strikers that were really good and they were first year pros. Now, I'm, I've got to Fulham Stadium where you've got to think, I've always wanted to be a footballer. I've sent letters. I've, yeah. I've written letters. I've sent letters. I've been trying to get into the game. I finally signed. I was second year YTS, but a non on non contract forms because they had already used their quota of of yeah. uh, children. Mm -hmm. So I was on non contract forms. I'm happy to be there. They've they've. It seems like I'm going forward. And then first half of this game, we're three 0 down, right? And obviously oh, I'm a centre. But I was I was I was like overall Fulham's training ground was amazing. Mm. I was like. So happy to be there. I was like, oh, this is amazing. So I was more like just kind of just being part of it. <laughs> just just watching what's going on. Like, oh, this is the pitch is so nice. <laughs> These guys are good. Their kits are really good. They even have Lucas Aid on the side and all this stuff. <laughs> We're all a little bit like, shop and get your own. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so everything I'm paying attention to is and I'm not really paying attention to the game, and I'm playing against first year pros. Mm. So my um get to half time and my coach um jimmy gilligan he um he just he looked he pulled me off he said you're not playing the second half and he he well i know you can swear it but i don't really like saying the word but he called me a see you next tuesday yeah <laughs> right so he's pulled me wow. off this is my first this is my first game of the season signed at watford and he said to me you you can't you're not playing again that was my first game. Wow. Right? Wow. And that he was, was true it. to his word. I didn't play again. Right? So I didn't play for about five months after that. Wow. So it, it was quite it was quite devastating in a sense. Mm. Because I've literally I'm like so happy that I've signed. My dad was on the other side. He could see like he could see I was kinda like tearing up because this guy's speaking to me in a way where not even my dad speaks to me. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So you are thinking I'm not used to being spoken to in that way. No, and then I'm my dream job, right? <laughs> and this guy's just rinsed me after one game. And I was not just even like, one game, half a game. Yeah. Yeah, well, less exactly half a game. So and then yeah, he didn't he didn't play me again. So I didn't play again. I, I used to just train and he ignored me for about four months. Um so I kind of went into a bit of a like a downwards not downwards spiral, I didn't act badly or anything, but I kind of knew I was never gonna play. So yeah. imagine training every day. And then, and then you know you're never going to get picked. All the all the boys can see it's happening, but you're like, mm. so I used to go. Um, my dad was really enthusiastic about me and and my brother Philip being in in football, and he used to come home and he'd be like, really, uh, oh, are you right, son? How's football? And I'd just be there like, mm. just, just, just never done. Yeah, like, just... I just, um, yeah, I think I'm going to get released at some point. That's all I think. It's just a matter of time, isn't it? Um, but luckily. He got a better job, so he left, and um, Luther Blissett took over. Mm. Okay, right. Um, so he looked at he he was looking at me and he was like, "Why aren't you playing? What's what's going on with you?" I said, like, "Well, I don't know. Look, the manager don't play me, so what am I supposed to say? I just come training. That's it." Mm. And he said, "All right." He said, "Look, culturally, sometimes they don't understand boys from London, right? So sometimes they look look at you like you got a chip on your shoulder and some certain things. There's some misinterpretation of." maybe my face or whatever mm. oh, and obviously Luther Blissett went through a lot of stuff to do with like racism and things yes, like that yeah. In, yeah. in that time so he said look I'm gonna I'm gonna just help you out a little bit and I'll play you don't you know train and, and just get your kind of um your your kind of love for the game back yeah you think, think of it I loved the game four months earlier and then all mm. of a sudden I'm thinking what is this and then within three months I was one of the only boys to get a pro contract Wow. So it swings in roundabouts, I'll tell you that. But you sometimes you need the right people around you. 
Um, And so I was lucky that he took over. And I I had a game against Arsenal in the FA Youth Cup. Jermaine Pennant playing in a couple of their... uh, Jermaine Pennant, Jerome Thomas, um, Mm. Paolo Vanazza. There were all these players that were coming through for Arsenal. And we lost. They weren't bad players either, to be fair. Yeah, they they were really good. And we played at Old Highbury. Mm. I I played on Old Highbury and it was an amazing, lovely pitch. Um, But I played really well despite us losing. I had a really good game and it kind of solidified my the pro contract I got a couple months later. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, just I didn't think it was going to go that way, but yeah, it it did. And that's how I got into the game. Yeah. Wow. Kudos I to mean, that, that. Well, quite. You're right there, Ben. <laughs> and 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 already at such an early age, that's it's such a it's such a a difficult journey you had to go through just to get to to even the the, the starting point of what was meant to be ultimately your career. Uh, there was a couple of things that, that you mentioned um, at the beginning of that that I just wanted to pick up on. Uh, you mentioned yep. your brother. Um, yep. And now, for, for those of us with with brothers, we, we know that there's generally a, a level of competitiveness between brothers. But when there's two set-to-be-pro footballers as brothers, is that level of competition just ridiculous? Or were you kind of – or did, did you have that relationship where you were just kind of backing each other all the way? Yeah, I mean, we, we're from a very a – very, um... I would say a very loving background. So my dad wouldn't tolerate like that type of competition, but there's always that kind of, I can do this. Mm. You can't do that. But I'm, I was aware that he was very special at a young age, right? He went through the whole England setup. Um, mm. He was tapped to be one of the, hopefully, well, potentially one of the best players in the country. And he was at that time as he was going through. Whereas mm. I kind of scraped through into football, you know, based on obviously what I just told you. Yeah. Um, so I was always wanting to do what he did because he signed for Tottenham at 10 years old, mm. whereas I was 15 going on 16 and I hadn't signed for anyone yet. Yeah. So part of me was just concentrating on myself and making sure I could get there if I got the opportunity. Um, and what I got from everyone was that I was raw. I was raw. I didn't have that kind of fine tuning from, you know, years of being in, in, in the game at a professional yeah. level. So I just had to try and do my best with what I had. So I was aware with that, although I wasn't like crap with the ball, I knew I had to work on it and, and just make sure that it wasn't uh, too much of a weakness. Yeah. Um, and let my strengths do the talking, my athleticism, my reading of the game, my ability to tackle well. Um, I just used those. And um, we had Bree Sevens on uh a week or so ago, and I asked him, obviously, kids growing up, they all want to be the, the main, they want to be the best, they want to be the main guy, and I asked him, how how does someone become a goalkeeper? You know, no one ever wants to be a goalkeeper as necessarily. So how did becoming a, did you always kind of naturally feel centre-back was was right for you, or, or did you, particularly no. when you were younger, trial different positions? No, actually, because I played for my, my district when I was, like, younger. Um, so I'm from the London borough of Brent. So I used to play for Brent. Um, and I got, I played midfield and striker. And I was, okay. I was really, I was actually really good there. So mm. Arsenal, Arsenal scouted me at that age and Charlton and Queens Park Rangers as a midfielder, um, mainly as a midfielder, because I was quite, um, I had quite a good engine at the time. Um, but what happened is, is I left the Brent setup because at, at a certain age, I was like, it was too, it was too clicky. Mm. Yeah. And they didn't tell me when I left, Arsenal came back for me the next year, but I wasn't wow. there. Oh, nice. So all these little opportunities, you know, that you, you know, sometimes you miss them. Sometimes you can catch them, but it is what it is. My, my life turned into whatever it is. And I'm grateful. Do you know what I mean? But there's all these little oh. things. You go, oh, <laughs> that could have that happened. That could have happened. Yeah. We talk, you talk. We talk to all these pros, all the current and ex pros, and that, and you do find a lot of the time it's being at the right time, at the right place, when the right person comes along. As you've just said, the blue for bless it. If he hadn't turned up, you probably that would have been it for football. You'd be doing something else. Yeah. Um, you know, and and, and you find with a lot of pros, and you wonder how many players that would have been like class that just were unlucky at the time. But yeah, it's it, it's a hard game to get into, isn't it? Really, it's. Yeah. It's, well, it's, it's not easy. I'll tell you what, another one, right? I went on trial to Sheffield Wednesday, yeah. like when I, was, when I was in high school and my dad, 
took me and one of my friends up to Sheffield and it took what four or five hours to get there yeah. right they played me for 20 minutes in the wrong position and then <laughs> that was it what it's oh. ridiculous. You, can you just so, say like that? Like, yeah, I'm saying about that. <laughs> you can't. And the thing is, you when you, when you're in those type of positions, you're scared to kind of say stuff because you think everyone else knows better, right? So yeah, it's thing like football professionalism, and and you think that they should know, and then they go yeah. slot into here for us for a few minutes, and you're like, well, I don't even play it. Never played it. You yeah. know, so I think he, I think they put me at like left wing or left back or something like that, and I was like. <laughs> what? I'm not even left with it. And then um I think it was it was Ricky Hill, um, who was the coach at the time. And he was like, Oh, you know, you're not good enough. I was like, <laughs> I've been here 20 minutes, right? We've driven five hours, which means a 10 hour round trip for my dad, who took a day off work. Yeah. God bless him. And and that and that was that. They just they was like, Yeah, no. And then I saw, funny enough, when I signed for when I signed for Watford, I'd been released by by Tottenham as well. Mm. Ricky Hill ended up going to Tottenham as the youth team coach for my age group when I was at Watford. So Watford ended up playing Tottenham. So I had I had two two markers out on that day when I played them, and we smashed them three 0 I was like, "There's no way I'm conceding the goal against Ricky Hill." <laughs> and then and then he had the cheek to come and talk to me afterwards. He's like, "Oh, you've improved, then." I was like. <laughs> 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 I mean, really? Did you tell him where to go? Did you, did you say that? No, you can't. In your head, you, like, I'm, a, I'm a kid. You you have to be careful. Oh, I you. mean, you I, I, I have a short fuse these days and would be tempted to. At that age, I can only imagine what I would at least want to have uh, said. You sit like there and you, you're like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I go home to my dad. I went over to my dad. I was like, "Oh, Ricky Hill was at Tottenham, and obviously we played Tottenham. We beat him three 0 And he was like, "Yes." I said, um, "Yeah." He, he told me that I'd improved from the last one. He saw me. He was like, oh, "My dad, you fucking did it." He just lost his head. He's like, All the anger that he'd been feeling. It was hilarious. Um, but you know. Yeah, yeah, like I said, these are all funny experiences when you think about them, you know, later on. So this is this is obviously streaming live currently on, on Facebook, Twitter and on YouTube. And we've got people watching along who are sending comments in via various social media. So, so we will flash some of these up, as I explained uh, beforehand. And they might not necessarily follow a, a particular flow, but th there's some that I'd like to show you here. And, and good evening to yeah. everyone watching along live. Um, quite an important one, I think. Um, and and obviously, respect if there's a, a, only up to a certain level you'd like to discuss it, but but a very good friend of the show, Danny's uh, messaged in and asked, did you personally experience racism in the game? And do you think things have improved as in the way clubs approach it? Um, well, it's hard for me to say now that I'm not in the game, how well it's being managed. Um, I went through some quite early on. So when I was at Watford, we went on, we went on tour to Italy, right? And I was one of the, I was 18 at the time. Um, and I remember like, I was so happy just to be on tour. Gianluca Viali was the manager at the time and Ray Wilkins. Um, wow. So they, they wanted to take us abroad. And it was like literally traveling with a God in that sense, because when you're in Italy and you know, you've got Viali who's a world cup winner. It's like everywhere you go, there's crowds everywhere. Yeah. Um, and we, we played this local team and, um, and I remember going, I was playing right back at the time. So when I was 18, they kind of molded me to right back center back. Mm -hmm. and um so i was playing right back and i went to go and get one of the balls for a throw-in against this local team and i remember being spat on and being called a negro right now every at, at that point that was the first experience of racism that i ever had it was like negro too and i just felt something on my neck and i was like ah oh, don't tell me that's what it is and you're thinking a mile a minute your mm -hmm. everything's mm -hmm. running through your mind. I'm gonna punch this guy in the face. Then then the other side of you goes, Don't do that. You're here with you know, with an opportunity. You can't do that. And it bothered me. I couldn't I didn't even think about the rest of the game. All I could think about was you know, I did play the rest of the game, but I just kind of ghosted it. You know, mm -hmm. just on yeah, that's, that's, that's the whole point. That's what they're trying to do is get in your head just to Yeah. That's even exactly make you red or just put you off. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a shit thing to do. It's shit. Well, it was, and I kind of sat and I reflected on that on the night because obviously at Watford there was a few black players that we had, 
Um, and so I kind of approached some of the older black players and I was saying to them, like, what would you do with that? Because it's bothering me a lot. Like, because uh, when you're young, you, you have to kind of taper your, your behavior. You want to show that you can be professional. You want yeah. to have the to succeed. So you don't know what you should take and what you shouldn't. Now, if that was in the street, that's a fight, yeah. you know, but this is happening in an environment where we're, in, you know, we're in a different country. Um, so they said, "Look, we've had bananas. We get have we get we get monkey chance. We get this. We get that." Because they were older than me, and they was like, you, "You've just got to learn to take take that, because it's in a position. You're in a position where if you do anything, you always look bad. Mm. You know. So you're then hoping for people to protect you and for the system to protect you, so that you don't have to react, right? Now, obviously, you can see that even now with what happened." prior one what was the one where we missed all the penalties the euros was it yeah um and you saw what happened with that yeah. now we need uh, protection it's just unbelievable yeah yeah so just, even they didn't get that type of protection because the world's so open now with social media yeah and if we don't teach people to respect difference you know then it's it's hard because you can you can put all the rules in place you want but if personally you don't respect others you're not going to listen to the rules, you know, it just, that's just how it works, you know. And so do I feel it's it's improved? Yeah, to a degree, I think it's more because it's more we're more open about it. That, you know, things can be done, you know, so I remember when I was doing it, it was like kick racism out with racism, the red card and all that kind of stuff. And there's all sorts of different. Um, there's also different initiatives that will come out when they feel the need to. Um, but in, in the English game, I, I received a couple of, um, it's like indirect racism. I remember me and, um, playing against Rochdale and, um, we were away, were it Rochdale or Burton? No, it was, I think it was, I think it was Burton, sorry. Hmm. Um, and it just after it was just as the the whole Jade Goody scandal had come out with Shil Pachetti. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. And um, we were we were warming up. Me and Kevin and Manko were warming up on the side, and just you know, just doing whatever we do before the game. And you can just hear this guy going, "I love Jade Goody, I love Jade Goody," and you know what he's trying to do. Oh, like, yeah. And so we're, <laughs> we're like, "Can you hear him?" And we're, he's like, "Yeah, I can hear him." And so we're like, what a prick. But anyways, we beat them like something. I can't remember what it was, but we won. So me and, and Kevin just ran over to them. It was like, yeah. <laughs> they're nuts it's like you wanted to climb over but you do your talking you do your talking with um with your with your feet at times you know and you and you you know my agent was um Cyril Regis so right. I had a very good mentor yeah so when when I was going through like some of the hard times in my in my career I always had him so he'd always be at the other end of a phone and he was a great person he was he wasn't just like a football agent he was like a life mentor yeah. So all the things with my wife and things like that, if I was trying to get advice with how to be a better man, husband, dad, whatever, he was always, he was always there. Um, so he, he gave me a lot of advice because he had bullets sent to him and all sorts, you know what I mean? From his day. So you kind of, you don't want it. You don't want racism to be about, but also you're thankful you're not in, you're not back then. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Sure. On a, um, on a on a slightly and and thank you for for going into the detail on that. Um, a couple more questions we've had sent in, perhaps slightly on a on a more cheerful note. Our friend Liam uh, from another podcast, Lower League Look, he said, "I have a question. You left Swindon in 09 and went to Aberdeen. Your debut was a trial against Hull in Dean Windass's testimonial. What was that like? And do you recall anything specific about Dean?" Nope. He's done his research for this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised Liam can read. <laughs> oh, Liam. No. Liam, Liam probably knows more about it than Gerald does. <laughs> you probably Gerald's did. like, I turned back to Hull and played a game. That was all it was. I know yeah. that much. Well, that was all a bit of a. That was so much of a rush. Like, I, I was I was sub for the for the first game of the season. Um, I was disappointed that I hadn't I didn't start the season because I felt that that I'd. I'd played well enough to earn my my position. And then Danny Wilson told me that, you know, Mark McGee had 
um, asked if I could go on trial. Um, and he said, it, look, it could be a good move. If not, if, if the trial doesn't go well, just come back and we carry on. Um, and I thought, you know what, why not? So I was actually more, it happened so quickly. I had to go from the game, quickly get some stuff from home and then drive up to Hull. And I stayed in the hotel and then I played the game the next day. So everything in terms of trying to like, uh, the, the person that I remember was, was I played against Daniel Cousins. Um, and, um, uh, is it for, Fortune, Fortune or something like that. I can't remember his name, but there was two strikers that were doing quite well in the Prem and they just got relegated. So Dean, Dean Windass was obviously, wasn't really playing. He, he, he played some for us and then some for them. Mm. So he was just there as like, they were showing him respect and, you yeah. know, kind of, but they, I don't think he was at the peak of his, of no. his power. Back end, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. it wasn't quite uh, playoff final volleys from the edge of the area, Dean Windass. Yeah, no. Is that what we're saying? I actually played against him when I was 18 for Watford against um, Bradford and we lost 2 0. So none of those goals were, were my fault, but he scored <laughs> for the corner. So Dean from that, him. you know, he, he, did, um, he did well in that game, um, from what I remember, um, but not from the testimonial. Um, Danny has sent another one in and you actually mentioned this before we went live uh, she says was it great being back playing in the Legends game against this country stars yeah it's always, it's always nice to go back and, and kind of just just it's like that nostalgic feeling and you, you, you have a lot of good times there you know a lot of my life how my life kind of is panned out now is because of Swindon Town you know so going back and just smelling the smell of the changing rooms and just that kind of visceral, <laughs> I know, uh, I remember this. Even though it's changed, it's still the same, if that makes sense. It's, yeah. It still feels the same, um, especially when you walk out. But obviously there's, the crowd isn't as as big, but it just feels nice to just just be there. It's, it's, it feels like home in a way. Mm. Right? It just it just feels, you just feel comfortable there. You know, yeah. it's, just, it's, it's just how it is. Love the place. Love the place. Yeah. In relation to the first question she asked, she, uh, Danny's follow thank you so much for answering that. Really appreciate you being so open and honest regarding such an important subject. And she agrees it's all about respecting people's differences. Um, so we, we've had a number of, of questions and, and comments through people who said they might not be able to, to watch this one live and will either watch or listen to it back as well. Yeah. Um, well, what are they doing? What are they doing? Why are they not? Why not? What else are you doing at ten o'clock on a Tuesday night? <laughs> you know what I mean, you got <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, some of some of the ones uh, that I I was sent to to just mention to you, not not questions, just mention to you. One said, uh, uh, "Can you thank Gerald for one of my funniest memories of watching Town over the years when he walked over to pick a ball up for a throw in, and the ref then gave a free kick for handball." I said, yeah, no problem. I can do that. <laughs> um, got one message when we announced you were coming on saying he was my idol growing up. So I said, yeah, I'll pass that on as well. Um, and it. also one of our one of our panellists, um, who, who's not on tonight, but one of our regulars, Joe, he quite often, he's told me a few times a story about how not that long ago, maybe just a few months ago, um, <laughs> he saw you driving about town on a roundabout and just shouted at you out of his, out of his car window, just started chatting, Gerald Eiffel Bees as she was going around <laughs> the roundabout. I was like... I can only imagine how I would react if I'm driving round and round about and people start shouting out their cars at me. <laughs> Ridiculous. Um, crazy. So you said, obviously, you've, you've done Watford and then you, you actually had three loan spells at Swindon before signing permanently. Was mm. How did that kind of come about? Was there a reason it was three loan spells? At any point, were you asking to sign permanently or were you waiting for Swindon to make the move? No. Um, the first loan spell... Um, just just happened, and I think I done done well enough that we had to just do it again, if that makes sense. Um, and then I think that they wanted to help with the push for the playoffs, so it happened again. Um, every like every time I would go back, they would say, "Oh, you did excellent, Andy King. Really impressed with you. Um, you're doing really well." Because I, I think at that time I'd signed a three year deal with Watford. So I was seen as like a prospect for Watford at the same time. Yeah. 
Um, so, yeah, it, it just happened, managed to happen in that way. I, I, I didn't dictate any of that. It was just right. Mm. Uh, get some games. Swindon will still take you. Um, you know, you did really well. I like the place. You know, I like Sam Parkin, Steph, Miglio Ranzi. You know, we used to drive in together. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I just enjoyed being there. If, if anyone told me to go, I'd go. Obviously, my, my aim was to stay at the highest level possible. Um, so I was always seeing it as just a way to to get games mm -hmm. because obviously it was hard with Watford at times um, just because of the pressure on the manager and stuff to succeed. You don't just drop centre backs into 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 it like you would a winger or a yeah. striker speak because um, <clears throat> you won't even get you won't even get like the back end of a game, you know, because what sense would it make? You know, you maybe one nil up. You throw you throw in a centre back, you draw one one. <laughs> That's not going to look good. So no. you always had to kind of go and get full games as a centre back or a defender. Mm -hmm. You know, so you know I, I was just happy I was getting games to be honest. And when you did sign, you went on to make well over two hundred appearances before leaving. Is there any particular games moments? I mean. I've got a couple that I want to ask you about, but from your perspective, where, where, now that you are, like you say, you, you've come out of the game now, when you look back, is there any particular games or moments that you think, you know, either that, that was a, a real good memory to have or, do you know what, when I look back, that's one that I wish had been different? Um, not so much games, but periods of being, I was there for so long, it's hard to pick out yeah. a game um, because, you know, I think I was, what well, I think I was at 248 games when I left. Yeah, um, quite, yeah. And, um, you know, there was just periods, you know, when I was on trial, not trial, when I was on loan, it was great coming in and still getting a bit of training from Watford and this and that. Mm -hmm. When I first signed for, for Watford, uh, for Swindon, I realised that Andy King didn't train us as hard as what I was used to in terms of being at Watford. Um, so then we went through a period, I went through a period of being unfit and, and mm -hmm. being mature enough to know that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having this, and this is this is where it's important to understand professionalism because when you get an opportunity to relax, if you're professional, you don't. Mm -hmm. If you're unprofessional, you will. Mm -hmm. right. So, so going from from Watford where they demanded this professionalism from you, and then all of a sudden going into um, going to Swindon, and he was like, "Oh yeah, you got." Monday off, Tuesday off, Wednesday off, <laughs> just ten days off, and I'm like, oh, happy days! I don't have to come up <laughs> to Swindon, you know. So I did no extra training, but I didn't realize that I'm not good enough to be unfit. Mm. And right, I need to be fit. That's part of my game. It helps my concentration. It helps my focus. So when I went through the the periods of not playing well, it's because my fitness. I was taking advantage of poor management <laughs> i was like oh well you know i just had my son at the time and so <clears throat> i was just trying to get home to watford and help my wife out um because she had just moved to watford and then i had just moved to swindon um so therefore we i was doing the travel the commute from watford to swindon every day mm -hmm. so obviously to help out if you're going to give me three days off a week and i'm like 21 years old <laughs> see you later <laughs> you know, yeah i'm taking it but that's not that wasn't the long term that's not a long term aim right if you want to be uh, someone that has a long term and a strong career you've got to be professional you know but i had to learn that the hard way you know we got relegated i you know i was making mistakes left right and center andy king was making me look like an idiot in the papers you know there was all these things that were happening and so i had to learn you know and that's part of that's part of it so i had that part and then obviously the year after that i got um I got player of the season, um, players player of the season. I scored my first goal to get promoted and all that stuff. So it showed me the difference between being professional and unprofessional. Um, How was Andy King when you first signed him? Because you hear a lot of the Swindon players in the past and a lot of players who worked under him. He was pretty Marmite. Um, he was pretty standoff as a character, um, as you hear from stories of how he was, unless you were in his clique. And like his card mm. schools and stuff like that. How was he with you, with a young man just trying to break into regular first team football for the first time? And obviously, he was a, a, a character. He wasn't normal. 
uh, like an everyday manager, was he really? He's, he he was quite outspoken and he had his quirks about him. What was your opinion of him and how was he with you, bringing you up as a player? So my opinion changed of him as time went on, mm. right? So so when I was the property of, and I say property as in contract-wise, yeah. um, of Watford, he treated me with a lot of respect because I was coming from somewhere higher. You know, and he was getting the benefit of my training, right? When he had to train me, we, it changed because he wasn't teaching me anything. He was hoping that I was a finished article enough for us to get promoted. And I, I still needed school and I still needed probably a centre back next to me to kind of help me to learn the tricks of the trade and also to be more more of a professional. So as he realised he, he wasn't getting that from me, um, and he, I think he felt that maybe I let him down in a sense because he thought, oh, I thought this kid was going to be this and he's not. Mm. But, you know, children and young people need guidance, mm. right? So if you're not going to guide me to be the best player and you're just going to expect me to be the best player, then, you know, I think that's poor. It's, it's poor coaching in that sense mm. and poor management. And then when I play well, if you're going to threaten me and then you're going to talk about me in the papers about my mistakes and this and that, mm. you're not, you're not going to do anything for my mental state in terms of, do I want to play for you? Do I feel comfortable enough to play for you in terms of, you know, am I worried about making the next mistake? Cause you're saying I'm not going to play the next game. And, mm. you know, it, it starts to change. And so, you know, he's a human being at the end of the day. Um, he's, he wasn't perfect. So, with, with I wasn't disrespectful to him in that way when he used mm. to disrespect me. Um, and unfortunately, I will lose respect for somebody in that if you don't respect me. Mm. So, you know, he ended up getting sacked um, because you can't hide from the truth and the buck stops with him, you know. So, you know, he got found out. And, you know, that year was a bad year for all of us because it's hard to then pick up your fitness and your 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 morale your your confidence when it's already low and then the and then the stuff that came in afterwards if you and Nora uh David Burns or or well, Budgie whatever his name is you know all these guys come in you know thinking they can solve a problem and they have have even less experience yeah and you're trying to you're trying to coach kids that need experienced managers or at least managers that treat them in a way that they can feel confident and yeah, I, you know, I'm a grown man now. I know how I would treat people based yeah. on how I have been treated, mm -hmm. right? So, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> part of part of why I am the way I am now is by saying I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that to other young players. You know, if there was other young players that come through, I would always encourage them. You know, I don't, I don't treat them like, um, like they're competition. You know, I treat them like, you know, they've got something to learn. I've got to be confident in myself to have competition around me. It makes me better, mm -hmm. you know. And now that I mentor children and stuff like that, mm -hmm. I know how to to coach and, mm -hmm. and help rather than tear down. Mm -hmm. On that subject of coaches, and, and actually before I ask the question, a uh, very big friend of the show, Joe, has uh, sent a message in on Twitter just saying, what a nice guy you are. So uh, there you go. That's from Joe. Um, you. On on the subject of coaches, I'd, I've had a couple of, of things sent in about coaches. Obviously, anyone with any sort of longevity at Swindon Town is almost certainly going to play under or be coached by a number of different coaches um, and just sort of your experiences of them. I had one question specifically asking what was Morris Malpass really like? Uh, we've actually had one come in on the chat saying, so Andy King or Mar Morris Malpass as your preferred manager. Um, <laughs> Don't give me that choice. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> but on the subject of coaches, obviously everyone has their own different style and, and you've, you've spoken to Andy and then we've laughed about Morris. Was there anyone in particular who was more the other way and you really thought, do you know what? Yeah, they, they've got this right. Yeah, uh, well, uh, Dennis Wise, definitely, for the time that he was there, he yeah. was a player manager, right? Mm -hmm. So he, he knew how to make the players players feel good. You know, even ones that weren't in favour, he, he had a way to kind of 
make them play for him, right? Because you're not going to, you can't keep everyone happy. That's the problem with a squad game. Is on the eleven can play, and you need what twenty to thirty of us. Mm-hmm. So a, a, a good a good manager will know how to play that game, right? And he did it very well because we everybody enjoyed training. We had a great um, team camaraderie. Um, he looked after every single one of us, and he was quite honest when things weren't going right. And you rather people be honest with you and just tell you tell you straight. You know, and he was a fiery character, but he's a fiery character with everyone, not just some. Mm. Right. So I remember him. I think we we drew one one with Wickham, <laughs> and someone didn't mark mark their man. <laughs> he was told mark your man, and afterwards he just went nuts, and everyone's like, <laughs> eh. <Fair enough>. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so. So, sorry, Ben, were you going to say something? I, was going to say, I, I do have a, a, a question, really. I know we're going here, there, and everywhere and stuff. Um, about, so I'll uh, keep it season, relatively on track. Um, about the season under Ifeonora, actually. And yeah. um, at the time, um, um, for, for poor Ify, um, we had Ron Atkinson, and I don't know whose <laughs> idea it was to bring him down for that season to work Skies. with Ifeonora, especially <laughs> after what Ron had said and his career gone down the toilet mm. um, for it. Um, working with Iffy and him to be quite so intrusive and involved mm. at the time as well. Um, what was it like? Because you could tell, I remember watching it and the frostiness between the two. And if he just didn't want him there or anything to do there, him to do it, he actually left halfway through the season, didn't he? Mm. Um, yeah, what was that like day to day in training? Also, if Ron Atkinson, obviously, who 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 he was in disgrace really for what he said, um. Him turning up really, training, it's like, what is this guy doing here? What, what, what was it? You know, did did it affect the team? Because we got relegated that season. Did that have an effect on it? Do you know what? I don't remember too much about that part of it because it didn't last that long. Hmm. Right? It didn't last that long in in that sense. Um, it, it seemed more of a. It just felt like. It, it's almost it, it was almost like you know like how social media is now. You kind of highlight things and. Mm-hmm. And it just it, it, it amplifies what's mm-hmm. going, on, you know, and it was that that kind of feel to it. But obviously, back then there was no social media isn't as rampant as it is now. No. So that that kind of version of it, I look at this team struggling. This guy with all the experience is going to come and turn things around, kind of thing. And we're like, what, really? Like, I, I was I, to be honest, I was so focused on what the hell was going with myself because yeah. you know career was going down. Was I literally just signed? hoping to get in the championship and now we're looking at league two mm. you know so in in my mind i was just like i just need help to get out of this situation but no one really offered that to me and you know you have to try and find the answers on your own you know so that year was a very lonely year for myself and i would say for a lot of players who especially the young players i would say who you need you need to be able to like i said take guidance from someone and there was nothing there you know, and and you know, I would say if he tried his best, but he didn't have enough at the time to help someone like me. He was a striker, didn't really coach me that well. You know, I remember some of our conversations, and I was like, I don't get, no- I didn't get nothing from that. You know, but what? Who am I to say anything? Because I'm, I'm the player. He's the manager. I'm, I'm supposed yeah. to to listen. You know, and yeah, but now, like I said, now I know what I know you can see where 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 good and bad coaching has an impact on people and how some people's careers if they're not established enough yeah literally their their livelihoods are, are placed on these people who don't really have that much experience and yet they have a lot of 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 say yeah and it's like wow this is this is the industry we work in you know where we're all supposed to be professional but what i realize is professionalism you know, when you hear about someone like Cristiano Ronaldo, who is a consummate professional, mm. why ain't all professionals consummate professionals, right? But we still have the label. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. it's, 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 it's down to the individual to be the best professional they can be or the best person they can be, or yeah. in, regardless, not just football. It's, it's how you carry yourself, you know? So if you, if you want to carry yourself poorly, you cannot expect anything different 
you know. So when we got relegated that year, um, and yeah, I could have blamed Ify, I could blame Budge, I could have blamed Andy King, I could blame all of them for their poor coaching. Yeah. But the first person I got to look at is myself, right? So one of the biggest realisations I had to come to is that I can't be disappointed with my position if I don't do anything to change it or to make it better, right? And that's when I started changing my the way I, I was as a professional. I got mm. a personal trainer. I started looking at my nutrition. Mm. And then from that point onwards, then, yeah, you know, it's, up, it's down to the coach to coach me the way he wants to. I'm going to come in the best condition I can, you know, and it's down to you to, to teach me something or, or teach the team, get, get the yeah. tactics right, whatever it is, you know. And <laughs> I remember there was, there was a thing with Morris Malpass, right? Mm. He came out and he was, he, he was, he's so deadpan. He was like, "Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to do the, um, I'm not going to do the accent." <laughs> <But> <laughs> I was, I was walking next to him and he was like, "Jarrell, um, into no, uh, AC Milan. You know, they do, they do um, formation and pattern of play every day." And I was like, "Oh!" And this is when he was new, so I'm thinking, "Oh, we're going to be doing pattern of play, this, that, <laughs> other." Because he had great, he had great coaching from for to, to be a better coach. You know, he was he at Barcelona. Great reputation when he came. Yeah, good rep. Yeah. So his 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 CV in terms of who's taught him and where he's been, you're thinking this guy's going to bring all this stuff, right? And he said to me, "Yeah." So AC Milan do all of this stuff, right? <laughs> I was like, oh, "Oh, it really is it." He's like, "But you guys won't want to do that." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, cheers, Morris. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, cheers, so I was like, what? Yeah. Like, you, you guys, you what guys wouldn't do that. You'd get bored, you wouldn't. I'm like, what? <laughs> Are you being serious? Like, so you know what the best people do, the best teams out there do, and you're going to say, we don't want to do it, so that means that you're not going to do it, right? <laughs> and I'm just, I'm just standing, I'm thinking, I'm just rubbing, I'm thinking, did he just say that? <laughs> right? No. Like if you, He's if you tell us to already. do it, mate. So he had already he, his his mindset was like was like <laughs> we're not we're not good enough to do what the best do. So he's not going to even try, right? That's wow. not a coach. Yeah, that's not a coach. It, it, was, it, it, it was it was perfect. You know, in terms of for for you to say that, you know, I remember when um, Patrick Kanuka um, asked him about. Yeah. yeah, I think we was on we was on. Um, where were we? I can't remember. Where. I think it was on tour somewhere, but we were we were Austria. Uh, yeah, Austria, right? Mm -hmm. And um, he Patrick asked, "What type of football are we playing?" Right? Because we were getting confused. Right? We at one minute we 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 got the ball at the back and the same play out the back, right? And as soon as we play the ball forward, they're like back four, get up, get up, and you can hear Budgie just freaking nah. And so you're like, all right, we'll get up. <laughs> he did like, so we, yeah. So so he's we're getting up, right? <laughs> And then, obviously, then we're congesting the football, right? So it means the midfielders have got no space because you're screaming for us to get up as soon as we pass it, which means now the midfield have no space to pass, right, or, or to play, should we say. So as we're now bringing our strikers onto them, or left back, or left wingers and right wingers. And, and But that's what we're doing. We're like, what are we doing? Like, there's no space. And when we lose it, then, you know, the midfield and, and uh, <laughs> the midfield and defence are literally on top of each other. And so, mm. you know, one ball can get straight through us. So Pat asked it and he went, he went, whatever football you want to play. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that's not the answer. Yeah. Are, we, are we a long ball team or are we uh or are we trying to play out from the back? You know? But he, what, whatever you want. All right, cheers, thanks for that. Yeah, we'll we'll just do whatever. And well, then and, and then they have the cheek to kind of say that we're not we're not doing what they're asking us to do. But, <laughs> And and Danny Wilson came in after obviously they got rid of of, of I think Morris. it was, was it Morris. Morris yeah. And he was like, and we were doing it in training, and he was like, "What are you doing? We're <laughs> 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 just passing. Like, like, get up! <laughs> <laughs> like, what are I'm you think... guys doing? He's like, hold back, give the midfielders some space, <laughs> you know. And we're like, that's what they taught us to do. Like that's what they wanted us to do, you know. So. You know, Danny Wilson was in shock when he came. He was like, what are you guys doing? And that's like, all of us are professional footballers, but we have to listen to guidance. Of course, you know? yeah. So yeah. sometimes we're getting steered in, like we're getting steered into icebergs, you know what I mean? And we're drowning, <laughs> you know what I mean? But we're like, well, 
that's what they want us to do, you know. I'm told to do it. I'm gonna do it. You've got to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, we don't have the we don't have the egos or the or the status to stand up to managers like that in League Two and League One. No, no. You know, we don't have it. We're not. You know, everything's about oh, you, you know, you won't get there if you do this because you create a reputation for being, you know, maybe outspoken right. or that will get the manager to sack and all this kind of stuff. Where at the higher level, because these guys are world class players or at least top class players, you know, minimum, you know, they have a bit of weight and status when they stand up. Mm-hmm. And you don't treat you league, don't treat players like that like that up there like that. League one, league one, league two level. That could be your career like done through one manager. If you don't, if you turn around oh, and yeah. say, "No, nah, I'm not doing that," I'll speak to them. They'll outcash, and that could be your career. Like any chance you got it done as well, I suppose. Yeah, no, no, definitely. And I think I was I was a victim of a bit of that. You know, people used to say things about me, in and and it used to get around. You know, or uh, you know, soon as soon as um, Andy King started talking about, oh, he's got a mistake in him. Da, 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 da. You know, started saying that. That just went around the league. So every time I tried to go somewhere and do something later on in my career, even though I had a good career, right? People, are, oh, you got a mistake in him. Da, da, da. And I'm like, what, what are you talking about? You know, every defender's got a mistake in him. Do you know what I mean? It's just whether you're fit enough and focused enough to do your job. Yeah. You know, and you know, I'm I'm still quite proud of my my defensive record in that sense and the type of defender I am. But people will always have something to say if you didn't do well for them or they lose their job at the time that you're with yeah. them, you know? So they carry a little bit of bitterness mm. um, and then they go around, they go around and, and um, just plant seeds of doubt in people. You know, I remember I, and this is, I have no idea whether this is true or false, but I just feel like sometimes things just match up. Right. So I was on trial at Torquay. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I can't remember the manager's name. Ling. Uh, Martin Ling. Martin Ling. Martin Ling. Yeah. Martin Ling. Yeah. Club Martin legend Ling. at Swindon. Martin Ling. Yeah. So he was the manager at the time. And, uh, and I went there on trial. And um, at that time, I was I hadn't had a club for a little while. Um, and I'd just various gone to various different places. And um, he, he was really favoring me at one point he was saying the right things all the players were like oh you should sign you know you should be signing definitely got to sign we ain't got a defender like you bloody bloody blah and um we we had a game against Sunderland or who's I, I was I think who was Ken Wynn Jones at where was Ken Wynn Jones was it Sunderland, Sunderland, Sunderland. Stoke, yeah. and Stoke yeah. Stoke, yeah. Stoke, Stoke, Stoke. That, Stoke red on oh, Stoke. oh yeah 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 so um we had a game so we had a we had a game against Stoke on the Saturday, and that would have been my last game on trial. And I did all right. Came on second half, did did well. And I was I was thinking he was going to give me a decision on the Saturday, right? Because I need to go home and see my my kids and my wife in in you know a week or so. So I said to him, "Look, am I you know what's what's the decision?" He's like, "Look, I want to I want to talk to you on Monday, right?" So I said, "Oh, well, there's no point me travelling all the way back to London from Torquay, or sorry, mm-hmm. back to Switzerland from Torquay." So I might as well stay in Torquay, you know. But if he's if he's asking me to stay just to be in training, to have a word with me, it's got to be something positive, right? Yeah. Now, that that's how I took it. I wasn't expecting him because if he was going to say no, surely, just yeah. tell me on the Saturday so I can go home and go see my kids. Yeah. Right? So <laughs> I get there on a Monday um, and um, I go into the office and... Lo and behold, Ify and Nora is there, right? All right. So I'm, like, I'm like, oh, okay. Hi, Ify. You know, hi, how are you kind of thing. Um, and then he cost, cost just shot off. And then Martin, he was like, uh, yes, yeah, so I don't think I'm going to sign you. Right? I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, I don't think I'm, I'm not going to sign you. Um, I think we've got enough here already and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, what? What do you mean? Like, why would you tell me on Monday... Uh, on Saturday to come and see you on Monday. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, mm-hmm. although, like, I can't, like, there's no, there's no way of, like, I can't say much in that sense. But on that day, <laughs> I thought iffy. Danny <laughs> <laughs> right. Day. No, I don't, I don't, I don't know. 
Do you know what I mean? This just is just some coincidences thing. that we're saying. But the, but the coincidence was on the day that I saw someone that I didn't have a great time with, mm -hmm. and he gets on really well with somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, the way things matched up, I went into the change room afterwards. They said, like, Oh, so you signing then? And I was like, No, nah, he's just told me that he's not signing me. <laughs> they were like, What? <laughs> what do you mean? The whole team was surprised. I was like, Well, good to see you guys. You know, shook their hands and went on my way. Yeah, cheers, then. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't shake, like what just happened there? Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? So, you know, whether it, whether it did or didn't, it just wasn't meant to be, you know, mm. but it's these little things, the little, like you say, sometimes people can just go and just. Plant that seed, yeah. little, <laughs> plant yeah. Even if he didn't mean to do it, you know, even if sometimes, yeah. like, oh, you know, when he was with me, you know, always a mistake, all that, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that, at that time, that would have been 10, 12 years after he even spoke to me, you know, at, at Swindon. So you just don't know what people say so and how people carry themselves. But, you know, it was all, it's, it is part of the game, man. I, it's, it's just part of the experience. Tim has after, said, uh, oh, sorry, go on, Kieran. I was about to say, what was it like going to Aberdeen after Swindon? Because obviously it's Scottish Premierships, a weird, it's a weird league. Because obviously Aberdeen are one of the bigger clubs in it. And then you've got, you go play Celtic Rangers and then you go play like some really, some really small sides. So you've got to sort of get yourself up for the big games and you've got to try and get yourself up again for like the smaller, smaller games as such. Ibrox and Celtic Park must have been mental. Oh. Yeah, I, I love those games. I mean, when, when I, my first game for them was on Sky against yeah. Celtic um, and that was at home. And there was like, uh, it was a full house, 22,000, you know. So you got to think like when I, when I moved, obviously we were, the maximum at Swindon was 15,000. Mm. Um, so it was a bit of a shock to the system to have that extra loudness, the extra kind of, maybe you would say prestige to a degree because of Aberdeen's history. Mm. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's, it is weird. Like you go and play against 64,000 people and then, you're playing two thousand against two thousand, you know, two thousand people, and it's like, what is going on here? Like, you go from like the insane heights, but the problem is, it does teach you to be. You have to be on on point because the likelihood is you're you're going to lose to the to the to the big teams, even though the 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 atmospheres are amazing. Where you're going to do well is against those those lower teams. So you've got to be able to bring yourself up to speed, you know. But again. I met a clown of a manager. <laughs> <laughs> You've been a lucky fella, haven't you? <laughs> uh, I, mean, tell you what, I think I've had three, in my opinion, right, because everyone's got different opinions. And for me personally, as me as a player, I've had three managers I can say were, were good managers for me. Right? And that's, that was uh, Dennis Wise, Paul Sturrock, yeah, and then... Yeah. Yeah, Paul Sturrock and um, I say Danny Wilson, but I didn't have enough time with him to kind of mm. get that mm. full kind of benefit from him. But I just liked the way he carried himself. Mm. Um, and then I would say Craig Brown when at Aberdeen, but more so because of how he allowed me to leave. Okay. Um, I, I was I just needed to leave. I, I was getting depressed up there. I was just. Mm couldn't believe the the way it turned out um and that same principle you know mark mcgee had just had a had a had a bought a baby so it was understandable that you know maybe he was he wasn't as focused as he could have been um he was still living in brighton <laughs> Going that's, to that's, to me, that's a commute <laughs> <laughs> and now you think you're trying to what what no, no, Swindon no, was bad back he, in the day, he, but he's like going bright into he, he must have some money. He must have flown every like for the during the week or something. Like, Did you do that? Yeah, I Ben's mean, now interested in the logistics of it. How do you? What would happen? You know, some, you know, sometimes. What? Well, I don't know the ins and outs of it. But what? What I did know. What disappointed me is that I moved my whole family to Aberdeen. Mm. Right. So I had a you know me and my wife had a big discussion on. You know, this is a big move for the kids. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got to take them out of school. We, they've got to fit into a new culture. The system, education system, slightly different to the to, to England. Yep. You know, so for me to do that, and I, you know, pull my wife away from her family, pull myself away from my family, and then go all the way up there for the manager to not do the same. 
Yeah. You know, it it it, it so straight away alarm bells. It was like, where's this? Where's the commitment? You know. And then, you know, I just didn't I just didn't get on with the management. It's just it was too it was too it was too unprofessional mm. for for the size of a club that it is. It was too unprofessional. Yeah. Um, and what they would claim to be professional wasn't because, um, you know, you, you know, when, when you've seen professional with someone like yeah. Dennis, you know, who's had that Premier League, um, that, that kind of he's been trained in that way. And he also yeah. in that way. Mm -hmm. So when you see that and you see what what can be on offer and then you get the the opposite. Give me one second. My cat is is meowing, right? And I think oh, mate, you don't have to tell me about you cats. Might, mate, you might want to shit. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get this on the, on the sofa, Vic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Joe, so, take care of that. Uh, uh, just a reminder that we'll Steve, be... Steve, well, 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 we're here. Who's on your back of your blue away oh. shirt back in the day? <laughs> Ger Gerald was on the back of my blue away shirt <laughs> back in the day. Yeah, I had Eiffel Five on the back. Yeah, I, uh... sorry. <laughs> um, all good. Uh, Tim sent a question in um, and has asked, "Have you still got any of your Swindon or other uh, team shirts that you wore? And do you have any preference in terms of Swindon or other team shirts based on kit designs?" Yeah. So, I, funny enough, someone asked me about that the other day. I. The 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 only two I have I gave a lot of them away because a lot of people would vote like maybe message me and ask for for some kit. Yeah. Um. So I'd give them some kit, or I just. Is this before the days of fully grown men pretending it's for the kids, saying, "Please, can I have your boots with signs at games?" <laughs> well, I had loads. I had so many um, town kids, and I, they were just. Like, I don't have a big wardrobe, you see, so. I, <laughs> My wife's got the biggest wardrobe, so I framed the one where we got um, promoted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a Watford kit when I played into Milan, and I've got Ronaldo R9 and Clarence Seedoff's. Um, wow. I've got, I've got that framed. Um, and then the Aberdeen kits were really nice. And then I've got the the away white and blue Swindon Town one. Yeah, um, yeah, with the old with the old logo on it. Yeah, the old diamond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I I love that kit. So I've got that one still. Um, yeah, I I I've got one. There's there's I keep ones that mean something to me. So even when I played uh, semi pro um, for Staines, um, they got to the first round proper. Mm. Um, and that's obviously on there on on the arm. Easily, yeah. So I get, mm -hmm. get that one. Um, yeah, I've got I've got all my shirts for each team. Yeah. Um, so I've still got those, but obviously my promotion shirt is is my shirt, and then obviously the one with the R nine is they're the two of my favourites. Can we talk about that goal now? Yeah, so I've been waiting to bring it up. So we, we've heard, in terms of, I, I asked you earlier about moments, and there's two that I've been messaged about a number of times. Um, mm. There was the goal versus Warsaw. Yeah. And and there's been a number of different ways it's been described to me. So all, <laughs> all I'm going to say is Hereford and let people decide who uh, how, how they want to describe it. Um, obviously, let's, let's talk the Warsaw goal, because, Kira, you, you mentioned it at the start, didn't you? <laughs> Sorry, yeah. one, one That's second. Right. My son has come in. What do you got? I know, I was going to show you something. Oh, no, you can't show me nothing. You <laughs> 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 yeah. might disappear from this house. They don't know what to do. Do you know what I mean? They're like, where's that? <laughs> <laughs> we, we can hear him. We can't see it. Where is he? Which room is he? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, let's talk the goal versus Warsaw first. And, and I did, uh, you know, one message just simply said, um, "Can you ask Gerald? Did he know how good it was?" Well, you knew straight away. Like the the ball was so good, yeah. And like I was just like, I'm gonna smash that because it was just there. <laughs> it's like you don't, I don't get that many opportunities because normally I'm stuck at the back, innit? So mm. to to be up front and then not up front, but in that area. Um, and then seeing that ball come in from Sofia, and I was like, "Yeah, 
And then when I hit it and I heard the cheer, I was like, and then i didn't even get a chance to celebrate it did i really because by the time i turned around i had what eight men on top of me so (laughs) well we we needed a point that day didn't we to go up and that put us one up i remember the entire ground was electric that day and i was in the town end and the limbs the absolute limbs my little head thought was gonna explode it was mental (laughs) It was because you found you we were going up then. It was brilliant. Yeah. Because they were playing for the championship. They were playing to win the league. Yeah. And it was, it was like worried, but um, yeah. When 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 that ball, because it was just bullet head of the back of the net, and just yeah. the release, because it was so tense, just amazing. Yeah, amazing. it was a great. That was a great day, man. It was so good. Yeah. Like, like the the thing with that time of the of that time of of my career there was that everyone was involved in that year the the families were involved the, the, uh, you know the, the 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 connection between the the fans and the players we had characters back then do you know what i mean like lee peacock christian oh, robert like myself core you know there were so many characters and we kind of we kind of merged with the with the crowd and the mm. fans so there was this really nice togetherness that I've never felt in any other at any other part of the seasons that we've had. Mm. It was everything just kind of everything was really really good. You know, you just enjoyed coming to training. You just had a there was a great feel about it. The managers got on with the players. The players got on with the fans. The fans felt good about what we were doing. You know, and we and we were doing stuff in the community as well. Do you know what I mean? Like we were we were going to the hospitals. We were going to schools. There was little yeah. things happening. Mm-hmm. you know and that's i think that drew everything together um i haven't i haven't seen a club or a period where it was like so much like that um in a long time to be honest but it was just a great period of 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 i would say swindon town's kind of history not just because yeah. of the level because it wasn't a high level we were at when we got promoted it was just that everyone felt so together Especially after the year before, because as you said, you know, with the iffy season and, and the relegation and the dire straits that the club was in, you know, even financial, oh, yeah, the financial stuff. That was <laughs> yeah. was, but that's all you all you have when people like that, when the money men are messing around, mm. you know, all you have is the players and the fans. That's all you have. Because without those things, the money men don't get paid. Yeah. You know, so we, we, you know, it solidified. I think that's what kind of solidified the fans and the players, because we were we were in a position where we didn't know what was going on. You mm-hmm. guys didn't know what was going on, <laughs> so no, like you know, just play football and forget about it. You know, and you know, I think that's what we did that year as well. You know, yeah. we were fit fiddles. You know, we knew how to steamroll teams in the back end of a game. Yeah, you know? and Ladio's good manager. Good manager. Yeah. The, the the second one um, that I got mentioned a few times that the most common reference to it was a rocket versus Hereford is is the one that that kept I got various messages about. Does mm. that one stick out as as much as the Warsaw one for you? Um, just just not really. Shall I tell you why? Right, <laughs> I'll tell you why it doesn't stick out. Because as good as that goal was, Hasni celebrated, and the camera followed him instead. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I was watching on the bloody on the on the on the highlights on on BBC, and I was like, uh, "Why are they following him for?" <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so you know, oh, did he claim that after you saw the highlights? Because yeah, that was me. That was. Yeah, <laughs> did that he claim was it? <laughs> <laughs> he actually does. As well. <laughs> <laughs> um. Mike's Mike's message did. He said, uh, talking of Christian Roberts, did you see he spelled both your first and last names wrong in his book? <laughs> That'll be a... <laughs> no, he no. hasn't. Now, now, no. now, 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 now he knows. <laughs> Cheers, Mike. <laughs> like, oh, Christian. Uh, well, I ain't buying the book now. <laughs> 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 um, you've mentioned a couple of teammates there, and, and we've had uh, a couple of different questions um, about Part, uh, like centre back partnerships, things like that. Who who you work well with and who you haven't. And you might have established over the last hour that we don't necessarily always ask the most obvious or, or the most um, journalistic questions. We've had one specifically. I'd like you to met. Uh, I'd like you to answer if possible. And it's worded um, on the subject of partnerships and partnerships working well together. 
Um, who has been the best partner for you to move a piano? And if you haven't had a partner do it, who that you've played with would you pick to move a piano with? Is that Mike Dixon? <laughs> I, can, the, I can't say yes or no, but he's the ass to be left anonymous. <laughs> However, well, the fact that you've named someone specifically suggests you may have been asked something similar before. <laughs> No, I just, there's only one person I know that moves pianos. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, uh, seriously, though, in terms of partnerships, is there anyone in particular? Because you said, particularly growing up, you, you said you needed someone or it mm. would have been a preference to have someone there next. Was there any particular partnerships that you thought that you worked particularly well with? Um, um, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the, the one. And the only reason why is because um he he had to take over when when ad got um injured and that was jamie vincent right yeah, um, you know and and um we played most of the season together mm. in like in that promotion year because ad got got injured so although people spoke about ad williams doing a lot of that kind of being the person that kind of settled me down a little bit Actually, you know, for majority of that time, I was with Jamie. Mm -hmm. um, and so, although he wasn't a centre-back, he had an, an old head. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and that was where, you know, he would, he would you know, we, we would talk. And, you know, the thing is, it's just being, it's, it's respecting each other. That's, mm -hmm. that's just what it is. You respect each other. If I'm a young player, you respect me because I'm young. You know, if mm -hmm. you're an old player, I respect you because you're old. We have different things to offer at that time. Yeah. Unless you're exceptionally talented, then you offer something exceptional and exciting, right? Um, which is what everyone pays for, you know, when you see that excitement. But what he did is he gave me respect, you know. And I, I just, if you respect me, I'll do anything. You know what I mean? I'll I'll bust a wall for you. I'll chase back. If you can't chase back, you know, that's what I was about. I was a, I was a very giving player, which is yeah. what um, Dennis Wise said to me. I was too giving, in a sense, as a player. You know, because at the time when we got relegated mm. um, and obviously a lot of people were calling for my head, they was like, get rid of Jarrell, he's crap. He's, you know, he's cost us so many goals and all this kind of stuff. And whether I agree with that or not, that's what was being said, right? So he, what Dennis Wise said to me, and I, which is why, which I say he's a player's manager and I respected him is because he said, look, he said, everyone's telling me to get rid of you from the top, you know, directors, whatever it is, whoever's up there saying, get rid of Jarrell. He said, well, I watched your videos. He said, the reason why you make mistakes because you're trying to cover everyone else's mistakes and then no one covers yours. Mm. Right? So he said, stop doing that. <laughs> Let <laughs> other people do their job. Right? And that's what he said. He said, I'm going to play you for a few. I'm still going to make a decision, but I need you to do what I ask you to do. And that's don't do anyone else's job. If the ball goes out to the right, that's not your job to go and chase it down. Let the right back cut the face back, you know. And also, if you're a centre back, the, the centre midfielder can go and do that also. That's their job. That's why they're centre midfielders. They're supposed to come and help out wherever. That's why they have the engines, you know. So he says, stop doing that, and then we'll have a chat afterwards, you know. And so, you know, I played a few preseason get uh, preseason games, and then he brought me in. He said, look, I don't. You're you're my best defender. I don't need to get rid of you. He said, just don't do everyone else's job and let other people do that job. So that's what I used to do. You mm. know, and although although I played with A.D. Williams at the time, it wasn't so much what A.D. Williams was telling me as what the gaffer was telling me. The gaffer was saying, stop being so nice. <laughs> you know, because I had the pace to help people. So mm. I just thought it made me look good. But at the same time, when I get there, I've got to do something with it. And if there's no one around me, well, then I'm going to have to try something weird and wonderful and <laughs> that might work. <laughs> so, you know, he just told me to simplify my game and don't expose my own position to help somebody else's position because other people are supposed to come and do those things. Yeah. Um, so it was a good learning curve for me that year. And then having A.D. Williams there for the beginning was good. And then having Jamie there, just just he just took over and did, did, really, did really well for me as well. Um, so I would say... Jamie for the amount of time and then AD was kind of like the the experience. 
You mentioned uh, in the last part about the connection between players and fans, etc. And and obviously you were you were very quickly donned the nickname Beast, and and that was chanted every single game. Did you <laughs> like that as a you know? Because we we've had discussions about certain players in the current squad and, and nicknames they have or have not been given, <laughs> and and some that that sh- that particularly on our podcast we believe they shouldn't have been given. But for, for you, did you did you like that, or was that just something you were kind of like, okay, well, at least they're acknowledging me, but I, can't, I wish I'd had a better one. Nah, not really. I, you know, you, you you get what you're given, and my my style of play was was that I wanted to throw people into the stand. That's just what it was. <laughs> yeah. And and my aim was to at least do that once or twice in the game. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Because there's only so many kind of happy moments you get when you're defending. And, and one is to line somebody up and be able to take them out in a fair. <laughs> and then the other one is is a barge or, or a great last minute tackle. Because, you know, other than just doing being safe, you need to be safe and do the things that you're you're supposed to do. Keep your shape and all that kind of stuff. Other than that, you you know, it's, it's not that exciting in that sense. Yeah, as a fan watching that as well, that gives you great pleasure as well when you watch a centre back dump a midfielder or a striker. You love it, don't we? You just shout boo <laughs> when that happens. It just it's just part of the parcel of watching the game and enjoying it, really. So we used to love it. We used to love yeah. it. So yeah, well, it's part of it. But that would that and, and that's the thing, because you know, part of it is entertainment, right? So mm. part of me is a little bit like I always wanted to do something that got a cheer. And so what are the things that get cheers? It's to absolutely welly somebody. <laughs> it's a simple thing, isn't it? It's just this little simple thing. Welly someone you know, or score a goal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it, you know. So but football fans are playing. easily pleased. <laughs> yeah. Well, you think of it, right? If, if I remember times when I used to play, and obviously, you know, the billboards um, yeah. were, were around the pitch. Yeah. My thing was, can I get someone into those? <laughs> And if I could get someone into those, I was, I was like, yeah. So and yeah like, really game, like, <laughs> I just want to um, very quickly go go back to Watford just for a minute because there was something I wanted to ask and I'd forgotten to. You, obviously, when I started watching, you were you were the first of what became for, for a short period of time, uh, almost like a conveyor of talent that we would inherit either short term or longer term from Watford. So there was likes mm. of yourself, there was Anthony McNamee, there was. Darius Henderson, there was um, uh, Hammer Boatza, like all of these players. Was there was there like unofficial link, or did, did it just happen? <laughs> like just so happened that we just kept dipping into to Watford for this pool of talent. Yeah, and Jack Smith, my boy. Jack Smith, Jack Smith. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So no, I don't, I don't know. I think after I after I went, I you thought, showed how good that Watford setup is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, because all of them were my friends, right? Um, but um, I don't know. It just seemed like... I, 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 Mac, Macca came after Norwich, didn't he? So yeah. he came straight from from Watford. Jack came from from Watford. And I think sometimes when your career starts to um, not pan out the way you want and you want to get games, you try and, you try and um, you know, see where other people have gone and got success. And obviously, for for a lot of the players that were at Watford, I did well at Swindon. Um, so it might have been an easier choice than going somewhere you don't know. Um, so, you know, I can I can see that you know me and Hammer got on really really well. Um, Jack Smith. I really he, rated him when he played at Town as well. Yeah. Oh, he, you know these guys were frightened. You know they had talent. They were frightening with some of the aspects of their game that they had. You know. Um, you know, these guys, when I saw them play in the championship, were tearing it up at times. Mm. You know, and so, you know, I don't know. I think Swindon always had a good reputation for for treating players well um, when they were on loan. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and I would say, yeah, for even for my loan spells, I was treated really well. You know, so... Yeah, I, I suppose I don't know whether there was a genuine. Maybe there probably was a link that I didn't know about. Maybe. Um, Joe has messaged in asking, "How important is it for younger players to have mental health support on their journey through the leagues? Um, and what did that look like when you were going through the ranks?" 
Well, I think it's, it's, it's very, I think mental health support overall for young people is important, especially nowadays with, with what children and young people have to go through in terms of what status they have and, you know, what success looks like and all that kind of stuff. For, for me, when I was growing up, there was not no mental health help. You know, I was a young dad. Um, I was going, going through a relegation at that time. Mm-hmm. And at that same time, I had Andy King rinsing me in the papers. You know, now what that was doing for me mentally wasn't great. You know, and I had to find my own way. You know, so the only person I had at that time was my agent. And I was saying to him, I was like, this, it's like this guy don't like me, he hates me. You know, but he'll still play me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then he'll, he'll, you know, you feel like you, you're almost in a position where you don't know you want to play. You're not going to say no, you know, but you know you're on this kind of weird tightrope. Mm. Um, and it's, it makes you feel uneasy. You almost feel quite anxious when you're playing, you know. But, you know, for myself, I would say I've, I've got quite a lot of resilience. Um and you have to learn to have resilience or someone has to, to teach you how to have resilience or you have to go through something to, to, to build your resilience. Um, cause you don't really know how resilient you are until you get into a stressful situation, you know? So, so for me going through all that I went through as a young player, like I told you when I was at Watford and getting pulled off and not playing and stuff like that. And I've, I've had a very hard journey in football. I managed to find some of the poorest managers or be treated in a way which just seems to, it just doesn't match with getting the best out of me. Yeah. Right. And no one takes the time to, to, to try and figure that out and they, or, or not enough managers do enough to figure out how to get the best out of players. What they want is players that are going to are almost like really uh, players that will do as they're told. And, and almost like the complete article, right? So if, if you have to do some coaching, that's too much. We want we want finished articles. We want players that don't need too much coaching. There, you know, otherwise it's extra work. But what you'll find is players that get coached end up learning, mm. and they and they and they reflect and they can build. And if they're comfortable to make mistakes, then they'll be then they'll learn better. You know, if someone you know, it's, it's like the olden days. If if you didn't get um, you didn't get a question right they tap you on the head or something like that mm. you know you're learning through fear yeah you know and if if someone goes oh it's okay go you know try that again now obviously i understand with football football there's a lot riding on football there's a lot of pressure but if you're trying to get longevity and long-term success there's a there's a way of going about it you know and unfortunately there's there's not there's not enough good good coaches they're managers but they're not good coaches you know, and, and for me, that that was challenging, you know, and I know that now because I've, I've had all of the coaches I'm ever going to have. I'm not going back into the game. Yeah. And I look back and I can go, oh, OK, I felt this way because this person made me feel that mm-hmm. it was my fault because I didn't work hard enough here. Right. Because like I said, you got to look at yourself first. Mm. But. But if this person is going to treat me in this way, why would I want to 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 work as hard yeah. trust me with dennis wise every player would walk would run through a wall mm. every single player even even the ones that didn't feel as loved still got respect you know so yeah. uh, is it better now i would say the awareness is is there um because we're talking about it more right men's mm-hmm. mental health you know, you know what we go through let's talk about it you know, let's let's make sure um, that we're not suffering in silence, kind of thing, and I and I definitely agree with that. That should definitely be a thing that that keeps going. Um, but we, you know, the game, the game's hard and it is fickle at times. Yeah, and sometimes it gets forgotten. So we just got to make sure that we maintain it because we can talk about it all we like. But if things are not in place when when necessary. You know, then you're still going to miss out because it's not where it needs to be. So it's it's important that we don't just talk, and it's not just you know things of the moment. Mm-hmm. You know, these people these are young kids, young boys that have dreams. You know, so you know if you take someone's dream and hope away, they're going to be in a crisis situation. Yeah. You know, and well, what do we know about football? Most people don't make it, then make it. Mm. Absolutely.
mm. you know. I've mm. got um, I've got two more questions on on the playing, and then I want to touch on kind of what's going on at the minute, um, uh, you know, and, and what's happening with you. When football, despite being a team game, um, it it's, can be very individual. I mean, you spoke about the the life decisions you have to make about traveling, moving, uh, family, taking kids <laughs> out of school, and stuff. Um, yeah. So, in terms of the 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 personal relationships you can make. And, and friends within teams that, that you can make. Do, do you still, is, is there still people that you've you've played with that you're still good friends with? You can still co contact regularly or, or are they kind of a time shot or a snapshot in time? And then once you've gone, that's, that's kind of it. No, no, no. I mean, you know, a, a good friend will always be with you no matter what, you know? I agree. So, so Jack, Jack Smith um, and his wife, Sophie, Mm. Um, we, you know, they're their godparents to my daughter. Mm. You know, we go and see them. They've just had a baby. We've gone down to their house, and you know, we we chill out together. You know, um, but they're people. They, you, 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 people that respect you. You want them around you, right? Or at least yeah. you want them around you every so often because they live far away. Um, but you know, you know, you know when people love you and care for you. You know, mm. um, and that's what I got from, from him. Um, in terms of, um, others, I've got obviously Lee Peacock, lo loads of love for him, you know, um, cause we, we just, we, you know, very different characters, but we respect each other. Um, Jack Smith, uh, uh, not Jack Smith, Phil Smith. Um, I see him the other day, always, always good to see him. Um, and then I've got a few boys in, in London. So Anthony McNamee is someone that, you know, I follow and I speak to him every so often on Instagram. But he's he's, he's going to be part of my life forever because he was with me when I when I was dating my missus. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he used to use me for lifts because they lived in the same area. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so he was able to sleep while I was I was making that journey from Watford to South East London. And he was like, oh, I'm glad you met this girl. <laughs> you know what I mean? um, so, yeah pj's messaged in uh does gerald still have the iconic cornrows under his hat no, no. no. Oh, no. <laughs> long long gone man my wife oh, man. She used to do my hair and she used to not she used to hate that because i obviously when i had when i had um the cornrows if once once i sweat in them a couple of times you're training every day she's have to do them like every other week and she had my hair to do, my daughter's hair to do, my uh, my son's hair to do, because his hair was longer than mine down his back. And <laughs> so I bet she was, she was like, a no. pro at it in the end, though. I bet she's still like pro. Oh, she she was a, she was a pro, definitely. <laughs> she was a pro, man. She still does. She still does my daughter's hair now. She looks after it like like it's like it's gold, you know. So yeah, you know. La the yeah. last question on on playing then. Um, Sitting where you are now and being able to look back, how how do you reflect on your playing career ultimately? Hmm. Um, I I feel that I was blessed to even have a career because the things I had to go through to make sure I even played a professional game. You know, some people will think, oh well, if you didn't play in the Premier League, then you know, then is 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 it worth it? Kind of thing. But if I look at where I started, I was all, I was told I wasn't good enough. I was told yeah. um, if I wasn't in the game early enough. So because I wasn't in, got in, I didn't get in the game until I was about 15, 16, you know. So for me to be told, you know, if you're not at a club for, for, for this, from this age, it's too late. Um, when I did get in, I was too raw. <laughs> you're too raw. You're not going to, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to match with these, you know, these big boys that are out there with all the technical ability um then to have the managers that i had at the same time you know to to have a career that you know got to about 250 games and i stopped by choice um i'm, I'm happy with that and what i've come out of the game with you know like like we talk about mental health i'm i'm mentally well good you know i still have my my wife my children around me you know i haven't made any silly mistakes that jeopardize the things i care about the most mm -hmm. Um, so therefore, you know, whether I'm, could I have made more money in the game or be more successful? Yeah, possibly, you know, but would I, would I change it? Hell no. You know, 
there's nothing for me to change. I've got everything I need, and then I'll work hard to get what I want moving forward. You know, so yeah, I'm I'm happy, man. I'm and you know having these type of conversations with you guys, it helps me to to realize you know it's, it was worth it. Do you know yeah. what I mean? That's so it's so nice to hear, isn't it, Kieran? So, someone come out and, and say it in in such a way. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you like say you're having this discussion with with three people who, let's face it, we would have loved to to have done what you did, and and the reason uh, we're, we're sat here One doing day. this now is is because we we a we weren't good enough, and b we love the game so much that we have an opinion on it, and we're fortunate yeah. enough that there's. However many people watch and listen to our episodes when we put them out weekly as it is. And, and again, we, we can't thank you enough for coming on And because I, I found this. I mean, we've been going over an hour and a half already and, and it's flown by. It's been so, so interesting to, to hear your story. And, and I, it, it's great when we get to share our opinions on, on what we've seen. But to, to hear, you know, yourself, we had Danny Wilson on, we've had Reese Evans on, we've had Jamie Sandals white on this year as well, among others. To hear the, the authenticity of the story and, and, and the actual truth behind everyone's individual stories is, is unbelievable. And it, it really does make you think, but I, I, I enjoy listening to them as well. Yeah. Um, on, on, on the modern day, then, mm. um, and, and you've actually... Before we talk about what you're up to, you, you've mentioned your, your daughter a, a few times. Um, a, a lot, a load of us would have would have seen, obviously, when she was on Britain's Got Talent as well, um, and gone on to to do incredibly well. You must be you must be incredibly proud. Yeah, well, I've got I've got two kids that are grounded, you know, and you know, Faith is is talented in an area, you know, but you know, my my children are. Are, are my my pride and joy in it you know i created yeah, them you know i'm trying to help them to grow up and not necessarily be happy but to to deal with the world because yeah. it ain't it's going to be happy um so you know my son is he's 18 you know he's 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 a good young man he's 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 ambitious he's he's not running around on the street doing stupid things mm. you know he's a good young man you know so that's something i'm proud of you know, my daughter's talent um, is is one thing, you know, but she's a good girl at the same time. So I've got to protect her in one way. Mm -hmm. um, but what she's doing now is amazing. She's, you know, off the back of Britain's Got Talent. And, and you know, she, she's been in, she's been performing since she was 10. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So she was in the local area. Um, I think it was Nova Herod where she was doing her, her PQA stuff, mm -hmm. um, which is Pauline Quirk Academy. Um, yep. so she, she joined the agency from then. Um, and then she got into school of rock and Tina Turner by the time she was 12 years old. And then she said, she, you know, that all, all that stuff is all group stuff. Right. So she, so she wanted to do something on her own, um, which is why she chose to do, um, Britain's Got Talent because it's stepping out of the comfort zone yep. of being around all the other children and other cast members and seeing what she can do with her voice mm -hmm. and for her to do that was amazing and now she she got a lead role in a in a play called fantastically great women um who changed the world um mm. and she's the lead character in that along with another three girls who all played the lead lead role um it, of, they they interchange it because of child work regulations yep. yeah um she she was able to record a track on spotify um because nice. they asked her to um to to record a song, I suppose. I don't really know too much about it. Um, and then now she's in Bugsy Malone on tour. Oh, fair uh, play. So she's, um, she started off in Bath. Mm. Um, I can't remember the name of the theatre, but the main theatre in Bath, she was there. And then she's gone around the country. Um, she plays the role of Tamika. Not Tamika. Yes. School of Rock. Lula. Lula, that's the one. <laughs> Um, no, when, <laughs> when I was a kid, I remember Bugsy Malone, the film. I used to love it, so I, I, I remember. I know the musical. Yeah, so she's in that, and now it's now it's taking up residence in Alexandra Palace. Wow! So she's there from from now until end of January, and then I think they finish in Liverpool. And I presume you you sit there and you, you mentioned about how there's an element of football is, is entertainment. So you take full credit for the for the showman element. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> because I've got good lungs, 
she's got good lungs. She just yeah. uses them in a different way. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, obviously, uh, you... uh, let me let me just take that back because. Just just in case anyone wife, watches this back. Let's not let's not get to it. My wife used to sing. Okay, <laughs> so, where it comes from. It's good good genetics. Yes. <laughs> um and and you you're obviously now um into personal training yourself. Tell tell us a bit about how you. Was it a natural kind of thing for you to get into, and and, and how's it all going? Um, so I don't I don't do personal training. Oh, no, that's that's my bad. Yeah. Sorry, that's <laughs> a <laughs> great research, Steve. Damn it. Yeah. <laughs> well done, mate. <laughs> Sorry, they've been waiting. They've been waiting for me to do this one thing that I was always going to get horrendously wrong. And that's Kieran's big moment. I'm never going to live down there. Yeah, no. It's screen recorded on, on Twitter everywhere now. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I did. I did, to be fair, I give you, uh, you were partly right, right? So I started off personal training when I when I wanted to stop playing football. Yeah. Um, but at, at the same time, I started off a mentoring company called iProofit. Yeah. Um, so the I, iProofit is mentoring um, children that have um, barriers to learning, whether that be anxiety or whether they're at risk of ex of exclusion. Um, so any barriers they may have in terms of their value, um, staying in school, um, staying out of trouble. Um, so we've been doing that for the last 10 years now, so about a decade. Um, we've been running that. We've got about 150 kids on our books. Um, wow. So... Um, we're just trying to help the local area really and then hopefully beyond um just help them to, to help children to see the value in themselves really um by you know being good role models um so i feel like um myself and my business partner his name's danny um we we just believe that the backgrounds that we came from um we have a and also the success that we've had you know so i've told you my story right it's, it's not easy it wasn't an easy ride um, so there are children out there that don't have talent or don't know their talent yet, you know, so, you know, if they don't know what they're, what, what they're going to do and they don't value themselves, if yeah. there's no one telling them, well, you know, then they're left at the mercy of, of the streets or other people's opinions and of what they can and can't achieve. So what we wanted to do is, is help solidify a little bit of that value, um, by them coming to us and saying, look, we're not perfect. We're not hundred, we're not hundred percent, but if you follow, you know, a certain, you know, structure to your life, you know, there's a possibility of, of being relatively successful, or at least being ha happier than making poor choices and ending up in, in negative situations. You know? and, and so that's, that's what we've been doing. And anyone who'd like to, to find out more, I mean, we'll be posting out um, the links and stuff via our social media, but where, where's the best place they can find more information on? Um, so for that one, I, we've got uh, www.iproofit.co.uk. Um, so it's this logo here, there, wherever the camera is. So. <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, hang on. I, I've worked out how to do the uh, the whole full screen thing, so we can put you up on the big screen now. There you go. Yeah. So it's that. Jeez, there you, I'm, go. I'm, there you I'm, go. Yeah. So you know, we we've we've we're trying to just help out best way we can um, by using the methods that that you know that we've created you know based on our experiences you know like i said we, i've had a lot of poor coaching um you know when you know what it's like to feel a certain way when people talk to you in a certain way and they kind of make out like you can't do more than than what you would hope to do yeah. you know it's quite it's, it's quite down it, it gets you down a bit it, it, it takes away the hope that you have yeah so we, what we try and do, you know, you live, try and live with some hope because that was, that's what spurs you forward, isn't it? You know, hope, a bit of faith in yourself, a bit of value, you know, and we all, we all need that, but children are, are in, in a lot of need of that more yeah. so, especially those that are less fortunate. So yeah, that's what we do now. But I do, you know, I've got like a couple of clients on the side that I do, but it's not really a, a mainstream thing that I do anymore. 
No, you, you don't have to defend me. I'm, I'm big enough and ugly enough to, t- to take the hit when it's when it's not entirely gone gone to plan. Um, what well, I did yeah. want... should have done better than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I did want to show you was this message for from one of our uh, regular panelists, Ned, and he's just put thank you, thanks so much for the memories yeah. and standing your place at STFC history. When you because I suppose as an individual, it, it can be hard to to know what you mean to someone that you might have never met. Uh, yeah. So, when, if you see messages like this, mm. does that does that is that when you realise that everything you've been through that's not just for you but for other people, it it was all worth it? No, definitely. I mean, I, I've I've always been aware of the impact that football has on its community, right? My dad's a massive football fan. Um, I've been a football fan. I was lucky enough to be on the other side, you know, in terms of being on the pitch. Um, and so, you know, seeing these messages, obviously, they're, they're humbling in a sense because you only get to do it for a period. Yeah. You know, you know, I can't, my body now cannot go back and do what I used to do, mm. you know, and I can feel it. I can feel as I get older, you know, even when I just play play on a five side on a Monday, my body's wrecked for days. And then when I know back, like I used to do this every day at the at the highest level, you know, you know, you 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 realize that okay, for a period, you you meant something to somebody. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Somewhere. And and, and, and and in your case, it was a lot of somebody's. Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah. No, no, definitely, and I'm, and I'm thank, I, you know, like I said, I'm humbled and thankful that, you know, I was able to. I spent most of my career at Swindon, right? So, it's that's why I'm here. That's why you know I'm a London boy. I'm, I now live in in Swindon. You know, I've set my business up in Swindon, and and it's there to help Swindon. You know, so it it, it what I'm giving back is is a reflection of what I got at that time. You know, it's yeah. it's just what it is, and it's helped my my family love it here. You know, well, I said my family love it. My son sometimes questions it. You know, <laughs> in Dubai, something like that, you know. But there's always something better for teenagers. But you know, in terms of the quality of life I've had, um, the 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 love that I've got from the fans, and you know, when I was playing, and even now, you know, when you see some people, and they, you know, they talk to you and they give you a bit of time a day. You know, it's it's really nice, and that's where that kind of humbling thing comes from. You know, I'm not really one for fame and you know that kind of egotistical element of it. Yeah, uh, but you know, it's still nice. No, absolutely. Um, listen, we've taken up nearly two hours of your time. Thank you, thank you very much. We really, really, really do appreciate it, and uh, and hopefully in the in the not too distant, we'll. Uh, We'll have you on again, and we'll and we'll we'll share some more stories. Um, yeah, but, no problem. But uh, but good luck to to you and the, and the family with everything you've got going on. And we are at the actually at the time of the year where, where I can say uh, I hope you have a good Christmas as well. Yeah, you too, guys. Well, thank you yeah, for having you me. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, it, honestly, it's been our pleasure. Brilliant, mate. Yeah, no, and thank, uh, mate. Thank you for all the years of service and everything. Absolute pleasure watching you and putting the effort in. Great, it's a fan watching. Thank you. All right, take care, man. Take Cheers, care. Man. Take it easy. Bye. Bye-bye. Um, and yeah, a massive thank you to Joe for spending the last couple of hours uh, with us. Uh, we'll be back on Friday uh, where we preview the weekend's games, including the World Cup, because that always goes so swimmingly well when we discuss this. Um, ben, Kieran, any, any final words from you before we uh, before we sign off for the evening? Yeah, that went brilliantly, didn't it? Yeah, that, there's loads. We could have gone for hours. Even mentioned the Leeds game, the two-all draw and that. I'd like to, you know, probably chat about the World Cup as well with him. It would have been quite good. But two hours. So easy. Enough, so I easy think. to talk to. <laughs> yeah. Two hours is long enough. To talk to. I think I think an hour and a half it was spent Ben asking a question. <laughs> <laughs> <Hey. laughs> that is the one question. <laughs> 
I love you, Ben. I'm oh, sorry. bless you, poor Ben. I didn't even notice. I didn't take that long asking a question, did I? Well, we did. We did get two <laughs> comments in about uh, about you uh, asking questions and how long it takes. I just decided, in the element of fairness and professionalism, not to flash them up on the screen. Oh, <laughs> I'll have a look. No, to be fair, I think it's. I, I don't think it's a bad thing. It's because you get so excited. You get excited about in the question, like you remember something else. You like getting to the point, but you like the you like the build up to a question. You always know it's going to be a good question. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, it's all pop in my head, and it's just like, well, <laughs> I, rem I remember the Ron Atkinson thing and him being a massive drawback, and then, <laughs> and also the goal, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But honestly, chaps, thank you very much for your time this evening. As I said, Falls Russian will be back normal time, 9 p.m. on Friday. But from me, from Kieran, and from Ben, thank you very much for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed our special uh, almost two almost two hours special. Well, you could if on everyone else's screen I was there, but really it just looks oh. like you're going into Ben's armpit. <laughs> <laughs> And on and on that note, I think it's the perfect time to say thank you very much again for joining us. Um, I can see Mike um, thanking us free for the show. Joe saying great show. Woody as well. Uh, thank you to everyone who watched, uh, everyone who sent questions in. And thank you to anyone who's going to watch it back or listen back via all the different uh, media streams. Uh, but from now until Friday, we've been Fools Rush In. Good night. Take my Take my home.